here today with Stacy Whitman, Dr. Stacy. Hello. She's a board certified pediatric dentist and a fellow of the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry. And that is, correct me if I'm wrong, but just because you specialize in something doesn't mean you get all that stuff after your name. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that comes after the specialization that you mm -hmm. need to have that. So, but the reason I'm here with Stacy is I met her on our FDL. That's our functional, that's our code word at Ask the Dentist for our functional dentist locator list. And again, if you don't know about that, please go to our website and, and look into that. But that's really to help our patients find functionally minded dentists. And Stacy was one of our first signups. Mm -hmm. She's very, very um, enthusiastic. And I've spoken to her many, many times. And I love Stacy because she is one of the coolest dentists I know. And if you're a kid, that's important. Thank you, Brian. Uh, Thank you. She works in a home that's brightly colored. That's her office. Uh, I've seen photos of her office. It, I mean, I have a granddaughter. If, if my granddaughter, if you, if you lived in our area, Stacy, my granddaughter would be, granddaughter would be saying. Oh, thank so, you. Uh, her practice is, is like a home. It's colorful. Everyone's having a good time there. I mean, they're really having a good time. Uh, maybe that's just a, a facade. I don't know. Kids are tough to work on, right? Um, yeah. You've got a great a time. Um, your website is wonderful. Uh, you've got uh, um, great training. I'm not going to get into that, but definitely go to the website. We'll list that uh, in, in our show notes. But it is, for example, um, she's got like pictures, beautiful high-res pictures of high, of um raw broccoli as a background. I mean, this person gets it. And I always say that you should find a dentist that really um, kind of walks the talk. I mean, that is healthy, that is talking about what they're doing at home. And, and Stacey, you've got two kids, right? You've got two daughters. Two uh, daughters, right. yeah. You are in the thick of it. You are all about how to raise your daughters in a healthy environment, to minimize the exposure to toxins, and how to keep them happy and safe. So anyway, I'm so glad you're here today. And Thank you. Uh, thanks for joining us, yeah. So, Thank you, it's a pleasure. So how did you, um, I mean, I read and we've talked about it, but you, you went to dental school and, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, you're given a general dental degree, but how did you get interested in treating kids? Because I have to be honest, that's not everyone's first uh, thought, you know, to work on a, um, you know, a, uh, a patient that is wriggling and won't open and, and, uh, and is essentially very fearful uh, of, of that visit and they can't rationalize mm -hmm. what's going on. So how'd you get interested in pediatric dentistry? Well, it's so funny because when I was in dental school, I used to get anxiety about my pediatric rotation. I would try to like, I would try to switch with other classmates. Right. Um, so, but Obviously, it's very different now. I love working with kids. Um, I was a general dentist for a few years, and uh, something that kept popping up to me was this fear of the dentist. And I kept hearing it over and over again, and it would really get to me, you know, that they, they were fearful of me. They would say they hated me. You know, we hadn't even met yet officially. And um, so I took a step back and and said, you know, what's going on here? And many, many of them had negative experiences in childhood. So I just thought, gosh, it doesn't have to be this way. Like, I want to be the change. I want to create children who are, love the dentist and are excited about oral hygiene. And, and also, um, a lot of the patients I had, I just felt I couldn't really help necessarily. You know, they, it was so hard to unwind and unpack what was happening. I really wanted to catch things early and have more influence in the beginning. So, you know, with, with pregnant moms and new moms and young child children and babies, you know, start, start fresh. So um, that's what happened. And so I applied to a pediatric program here in Portland and I luckily got in and here I am practicing. So being board certified, explain that to me. I think, I don't think a lot of patients appreciate that. You can be a, a, a specialist, but then getting mm -hmm. that certification is one extra step. What is that? It is. So I feel like most go for their board certification now, but, um, it's, it's a, it's a board exam that you have to take. It's pretty intense. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a written part and a, and a didactic mm -hmm. interview part. And that was brutal. 
um, sort of like a panel. Uh, so yeah, you take that after you graduate with your certificate in pediatric dentistry. And so I did take that and I, I passed, I was sweating <laughs> and I think I blacked out. I don't even remember what I said, but anyway, it's well, at intense. Least remember, at least you remember it all. <laughs> it sounds I, like. I very much remember oh, most right. of it, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, that, that reminds me of what you said earlier about patients. That first dental experience is, is key to what they do for the rest of their lives. Are they a good yeah. patient that comes in frequently? If there's a little bit of a toothache or if they come in for pre preventative care, those mm -hmm. are the patients that do well. But the ones that have that bad experience, and again, the ones, most of my phobic patients can tell you exactly the day and the dentist and the facial expression of the dentist yeah. on their side. And the I mean, temperature I can, outside. Yeah, exactly, yeah, of yeah. that <laughs> moment because it was so traumatic. So, yeah, yeah. So, so you're right. You can, you are, you are way upstream when it comes to the, mm -hmm. the, um, yeah. the development and, and I mean, everything. The, the psychology, the behavioral development of that patient to the development of their face and airway. And it's yeah. a, an exciting thing. And, and it's not just doing fillings and little cavities, right? It's way more than that. Yeah. Uh, yep. and, yeah. I and felt it's a lot of work. <laughs> it's a lot of work. And that is what propelled me into the, the more functional, holistic realm of pediatric dentistry too was again like you said walking the walk that is how i lived my life and how i was raising my children but i was trained very you know very traditionally mm -hmm. um and i think like many in the functional world you have an aha moment mm -hmm. and you know after the ten thousandth filling that you perform you mm -hmm. just say what what am i doing i just didn't right. feel like i was really helping yeah um and again it's coming back to root causes and so that's what propelled me on this and, journey. And let's talk about that a little bit. So, and I agree with you. I did not get that in my training. Most dentists don't. I, in fact, I don't think of, I can't think of any dental school that yeah. really, really spends a lot of time on that root cause functional mm -hmm. approach. And so, and obviously there are a few dentists that get that afterwards because they seek it out. Mm -hmm. That would be through continuing education or just self-learning and personal health experiences. So, so why is that functional approach so important for you? I mean, in your practice? Well, because I mean, my, I'm a healthcare provider, mm -hmm. do no harm. And I just want to set people up to live their best, healthiest life. Right. Um, and it's, there's so much that goes into that growth and development diet and nutrition, like you said, psychological impacts of the dentist. Um, it's the whole body. And then it's so disappointing, and that's a whole other conversation, but how dentistry has been tucked in this box and medicine's been tucked in this box. And, you know, that's, it's just insane. I mean, it's part of our body and it's the right. gateway to our body. And it's, it's so important um, to have decent oral oral health and know about the importance of that too so um, yeah, the implications of that separation or the lack of collaboration between medicine and dentistry which has been goes back to the 1840s uh, yeah. that has huge ramifications and as you know and we can talk more about it but uh, you cannot be a healthy person if you haven't addressed oral health and and that yeah. takes a lot of work I mean there's a lot going yeah. on in the mouth as you said it's the gateway let's get right into it um, Okay. A lot of these questions, um, and by the way, we're going to do a round two with Stacy because there is so much to talk about. <laughs> and I think that may actually be maybe next week or the week after, but it will come soon after we do this. So, but anyway, the questions that I have for you um, are not my questions, but they are questions from readers from Acid Dentist. And we get a lot okay. of questions about, of course, kids and, and, you know, there's a lot of worry and a lot of apprehension with moms to be and dads to be and and parents that have kids because so they know instinctually or they've read about it they know that so much can go wrong and that mm -hmm. and you know they're thinking about their first dental experience which may not have been good and they dread that for their child and yeah course, one of the biggest questions i get is you know someone will interview me they haven't seen me yet and they're like or parents that are patients already existing patients they will have some children and they're like, okay, what's this going to be like? Because you know my history. 
How are we going to make this different? And so that's really, really important. Let's talk about that first visit. What is, when, when, and how do you make it um, really something that the child won't remember or will remember for all the right reasons so that they are a good patient uh, for the rest of their lives? Well, um, it, de for, it depends on the age a bit. So younger children, first dental visits, you know, we'd like to see children around the age of first tooth eruption or ideally around one. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of that is for education. Uh, we're educating the parents about prevention, mm -hmm. but it, it is also creating um, a positive experience and exposure to the dentist. And um, so we, we really try to let the child guide the appointment and my team are ninjas. I mean, they're the reason people have good experiences here. Right, right. They're fun and upbeat and positive and exude this, this wonderful childlike energy. Um, and you know, we're, we do all the behavioral things. Like we, we tell children what we'll do and then we show it to them and then maybe we actually do it. Um, we do offer dress rehearsals for families too. Those are great. Um, and we we just set them up for success, you know. So we we try to keep it light, and you know, of course, we have bells and whistles and things here that keep intro, the kids entertained. Cameras. The guys, yeah. the, the intro oral cameras, the young guys. Yeah, all all the toys and things, and you know, give them gloves and masks, and show right. them have them hold a mirror so they're participating. Right. right. Um, do an oral we, exam on their parent with a plastic mirror. All the things. Yeah. Yep. We sing songs if they're really young and you know, sometimes they do get upset, but sure. they almost always recover quickly and almost all children leave pretty happy right. after. How do you, you know? handle the parent that, you know, will shame the child at home or in front of you mm -hmm. saying, if you don't get a cavity free report card, or if you get a cavity, you know, you're going to have to get a filling done and that's painful. And how do you deal with that? Yeah, that's a hard one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we just try to divert the negative energy into positive, you mm -hmm. know, and, and start, we kind of then re, re guide and speak to the child and right. try to boost the confidence of the child again. Right. Saying, you know, ca you know, we'll say things like, you know, cavities are warning to us that we maybe need to make changes at home, but luckily these are baby teeth, and so we're going to get another chance, you right. know, so we just try to lighten the mood a little bit. Right. Um, the hard thing is when parents come in with their own phobia, like you yes. mentioned, yeah. and so we actually have posters around the office that talk about how emotional energy is transferable. Right. Um, which parents have really appreciated and just saying, you know, try your best to come in in a calm state of mind because right. I promise you, your child's going to have a great experience. Like right. we, we do, we have it dialed, you right. know, and it's not, we're not a hundred percent. There's, sure. there's a lot of factors, but, um, so that's helped a lot too. Sometimes, and sometimes you have to pre-medicate the parent, not the kids. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> um, but we get a lot of great feedback. I mean, parents say they've been talking about their dental appointment for months or like weeks leading up to it. They are their appointment. They'll just say, I can't wait to go to the dentist. I'm so excited right. to go to the yeah. dentist. So that, that feels great? so good. Yeah. yeah. When yeah. The kids are so glad to see you. They hug you and they just want to hang out and you can't get rid of them. And, that's job, we, job well, we, we encourage that. I mean, we tell parents to come by and just let their kids play. It's different Good. now with coronavirus, yeah. our waiting rooms closed, but we'll be back there. But we have like a give a book, take a book nice. um, type of thing. We're setting up maybe community gardens in the back of the office right. to, um, you know, help kids learn about gardening. And Isn't that great? So we try to create like a family here. Yeah. Again, you're not, yeah. these kids are not going to a sterile, modern, multi-level office with elevators. They're walking into a beautifully, colorfully painted home with a garden. I mean, I think that's fantastic. What a great model. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. We, I love it here. I love, in the space, I just, I'm really big into feng shui and like space and light. And I yeah. just think the building itself really helps. The energy yeah. in here is really, really good. It so, um, yeah. Real quick, what's your favorite uh, dental kids book? You know, the ones that parents read in the first 
you know, before they come? I mean, any, any good recommendations? Yeah, gosh. Um, I can't think of the name right now. There's the Hello Genius series is a really great series. Um, there's some, there's one book, it's for older kids, but it's called The Body Battles. Um, and it's called Your Body Fights a Cavity. And right. it really is wonderful with the level of detail. This is right. for a little bit older kids, especially kids that are into like Minecraft yep. or Fortnite. They, they tend to like that. <laughs> but for board, for board books, gosh, there's so many. I, I'm sorry, it's escaping No, it's me. fine. And I'm glad I asked that question because these are books I'm not aware of. And um, I always use the analogy of, you know, star troopers and all that for the, for the young guys. But, you know, um, later, uh, email me the list of books and we'll have like five or oh, yeah. 10 books and we'll put it in the show yep. notes because a lot of parents really like picking out the right book or reading multiple books. And, and you know, there's that Mr. Whitman, some, someone goes to see Mr. Whitman book, which I, I grew up with. And yep. that's, that's, that's old news, right? <laughs> I will say, I don't recommend the Curious George book because okay. they make the dentist very scary. Okay. So yeah, that's what we need to hear. We need a list warning of to parents Good. Uh, or at least skip a few pages in okay. there. So we'll, tear yeah. them out. we'll tell you which pages to tear out. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No, that's good <laughs> advice. Let's, let's talk about, um, Dental hygiene. Uh, a lot mm -hmm. of parents are very frustrated with that. They can't really, mm -hmm. they can't brush their kid's teeth. Of course, we tell them that for the first seven years, it depends on who you talk to. Sometimes I tell them the first 10 years, it depends. I say 10. I okay, say 10. There we go. Good. I say 10. Yeah. And then there's some yep. teachers that, you know, no one's yeah. going to help yeah. them, can't help them. But anyway, um, how, how, what's your approach there? What do you tell parents? What is the best way to make it fun and happy? Because parents, I mean, they're tired, they come back from work. Yeah. Uh, you know, they've cooked a meal and then they've got to go, you know, bedtime is coming up. I mean, there's yep. something going on. It's a very stressful event that carries on to them. Uh, yep. What, what, what works and what doesn't? <laughs> well, I'll, I'll give you the whole, what I, I all okay. that I say. So okay. if it's a, if it's a younger child and I have some videos I've made too, um, that people can see, but if we'll it's a really, really young child, um, two and under, what I used to do is I used to brush and floss my girl's teeth on their changing table. So I do like to pair existing routines mm -hmm. with new routines. Um, and then the child's laying back so you can really see what you're doing a lot better. But also I feel like you can engage with the child a bit better and sing songs right. and chase animals around their mouth. And I used to play memory games with my daughters when they became a little more verbal saying, you know, what did we have for breakfast? Oh, we had eggs. Let's get the eggs. You know, um, so trying to keep it as positive as possible. It, it is hard. It's really common. Um, did I lose you? Sorry. It's no, really video, common. Video went out. Sorry. Back, um, it's really common for children not to love it initially, right. you know, and so it's finding that balance of not making it traumatic. Right. It's the opening but, to the airway. I mean, of course it's traumatic. They're, they're instinctually wanting to protect that yep. from obstruction. Yeah. And some kids too, like my, my youngest daughter, she didn't like to have her face wash or her hair wash. Mm -hmm. She just didn't like anyone in her bubble. Mm -hmm. um, but we did really, I do really believe trying to be consistent, you know, and, and trying to make it a non-negotiable is best as you can you know if your child has a really clean diet and not eating a lot of processed foods exactly. which we'll probably get into later yep. it's i'm a little less exactly you know cracking right. the whip about it um but then for older kids you know it's kind of the same thing you can do chart systems and reward systems there are apps and there's fun toothbrushes now that are interactive and you know I think books help too educating them why it's important rather than just a parent kind of nagging at them there's one more thing that we need to do so um yeah so it, it's hard it's tricky but uh how about, flossing? how about flossing when should you start that on your kid that's tough to do so immediately <laughs> uh I would I tell my parents that come to see me this if I had to pick I would always pick flossing over brushing any day of the week. Um, I, 
I majority, a huge majority of the cavities I see are in between the teeth. We call them flossing cavities or yes. hidden cavities. Um, because in theory, again, if your diet's clean, your tongue, assuming you're not tongue tied, uh -huh. is doing some of the cleanse, cleansing for you and, you know, drinking water, but nothing is ever getting the food particles or the, the biofilm, the bacteria out from in between. So, um, I, honestly recommend not I don't want to overwhelm parents but as soon as they feel they can add one more thing in right. to start flossing even if you don't need to so as right. soon as teeth touch mm -hmm. you should be flossing yeah. where parents get tricked is a lot of times children have spaces in the front and that's right. really good we want that yes. um, so they just think they don't need to floss but actually the molars are touching are touching right you're right. Yeah, but I say even when they're young, like a year old, just playing with the floss right. literally for seconds yeah. just to get in that habit and to desensitize, um, it really helps. And then I say again, try the changing table, do it in the bedroom during nighttime stories, right. leave flossers on the side of the bed or in the, um, the bath, you know, yeah, in I the think car. It's important. I think it's important. A lot of uh, parents wait too long. I think it's easier to introduce something when they're very young, even though you may not be doing a good job or it may not be absolutely necessary, but why not play with the floss, go right to a toothbrush, no gauzes uh, or weird sponges in the mouth. Um, and then yeah. also I'm a big fan of brushing together as a family. I think yeah. you do it. Mo modeling, yes. And then dancing absolutely. and cracking yep. jokes or maybe yep. watch TV while you do it. I think yep. that's important, but it's, um, but I think you, you hit on a really important point, And that is, is that if the diet is optimal, then this doesn't become such a crucial thing. Well, how yeah. about the, how about the parent that comes in with a lot of guilt because <laughs> their child has all these cavities and they think it's, well, they know that it's because they've been feeding them goldfish and crap yeah. and candies and, and all that. What, how do you deal with that? Is that, difficult or, or is that well I will say this I becoming a parent really changed the way I practice mm. um, so I am on team parent uh, so a lot of my recommendations I really do try to make it streamlined easy um, but that being said I don't like the parent guilt the mom guilt right. I, you know I don't I don't want that it's unnecessary everyone wants what's best for their child mm -hmm. you know so a lot of times it's just you weren't taught you didn't have the education that's not your fault right and so I just really support them and say you know what you're here now right. and we're gonna take wonderful care of your child and now after everything's addressed and all the cavities are fixed we're going to become a team right. and we're going to work together right. to keep your child cavity free forever right that's awesome um, that's great yeah and that's yeah, reassuring and to them and you know a lot of moms can't breastfeed and that sets off a whole chain of events i mean it's it's yeah. not easy and no and, uh, there's a lot of misinformation out there real quick i just thought of something what yeah. is it about the distal of the first upper or lower molar and deciduous teeth. That's the one that typically gets the cavity. What's your theory on that? Always. Is it anatomy? Is it location? Is it, what is it? Well, cleansability, mm -hmm. number one. Um, and that is where, you know, the first the teeth gap start. I mean, that's where the first contact is. It's where the first contact uh, is. Uh, so uh, not being able to floss. I know there's some theories. Um, if, if you look they're about tongue tie too, like you want to be able to reach your tongue yes. back. Mm -hmm. That is one way I assess tongue tie in a child that can cooperate is can they move their tongue back to the distal of their molar? Yes. Um, so I, I certainly am not saying every child that has cavities there has tongue tie, right. but it, right. it's something that I think about, but um, yeah, it's common. I mean, it's yeah. flossing, cleansability. It's where food gets, you know, we're masticating, we're chewing back there. Right. Right. You're eating a lot of crackers and pretzels, right. you know, it's getting pushed yeah. down in. Well, with yeah. the tongue tie comes mouth breathing and the child's mouth breathing all night, their incidence of decay is gonna go up. I mean, yes. that, that we know that to be true. Uh, we knew that back in, um, we knew that back in the 1800s. Uh, that book I was referring to earlier, uh, I might as well 
put it up here, the book yeah. breath um, on breathing. It has a lot of dental information in there. It's very helpful for anyone to read that right now. I think it's a bestseller. But he pulls up a manuscript from the 1850s, I think, about a dentist who wrote how dry mouth contributes to gum disease and, wow. um, and, and cavities. And that's not something I got in dental school. That was not, it was decay. It was, uh, sorry, it was diet. It was acid attacks. Yeah. That was it. Yeah, it was soda and candy, yeah, right? Exactly. Yeah, right, right. And it's yeah, I is, saw but... I saw um, an ad in Life magazine with the chin straps. Mm -hmm. Have you seen that? They used yep. to sell chin straps to help promote mouth closure mouth back closure. in the 30s right. and 40s. So yeah. it's well, a lot of cultures. Um... Uh, back before the industrial age, I mean, they the mothers would always push the chin. Yep. I mean, yep. somehow they knew that the Native Americans have a have a kind of a mythology about that. I mean, it, it's in many many cultures, and I find that yep. very interesting. That's discussed in that book. Um, mm -hmm. How about let's talk about um, the impact of prenatal development? I know not every mm -hmm. dentist does this, but you do. And being a pediatric dentist, I mean. Uh, what advice do you give moms and dads to be that would affect their oral health, but obviously would affect them overall? Yeah, so I'm I'm trying to work on a program for my local OBGYNs um, and naturopaths that are helping parents conceive or um, while they're pregnant. Mm -hmm. So we are we know so much, and we're learning even more about how important. Um, nutrition is during those developing months, um, as well as sleep and deep sleep, you know, and quality sleep. So um, I also gut health, you know, the microbiome. Mm -hmm. So I do recommend ideally to, you know, I work for the natural path or functional doctor. I think that can be helpful. If you don't have access to that, it is really important to make sure you're getting the nutrition that we know helps tooth and bone development, mm -hmm. which are the the fat solubles are the big ones. Right. So A, D, um, A2. E, and K. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, so many are vitamin D deficient. So many of us. So, you know, it's probably good to get your levels checked. Also, your oral health is really important. And, and your spouses for when the baby is born, right. um, you can transmit mm -hmm. your oral bacteria to your baby. And that's often how children are initially inoculated right. um, with, with the bad bacteria. Right. So of course, um, the, the vaginal birth is the yes. original, most important inoculation. Yep. The oral microbiome really comes from the mom, but you're right. Don't share your toothbrush with your child is what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. Try to really be an advocate for yourself and push for a vaginal delivery. Like you said, mm -hmm. try your best to breastfeed. You know, there, there, are things that if you can't, there are things we can do to help um, correct issues, you know, like with supplementation and what have you, but really trying to eat nutrient dense food, getting plenty of rest, hydration, you know, just taking very good care of yourself is hugely important. Mm -hmm. um, so, so once yeah. the baby is born, what, um, I mean, let's say you have existing patients, uh, mom and dad, and you, are aware that they had their their baby. Um, how soon do you want to see them? What advice would you give even before you saw them? What's important in those first six or 12 months? Well, a lot of them have seen, an, if there's issues with their lats or breastfeeding, a lot of them are seen in IBC, I, IBCLC. So mm -hmm. I, I do phrenectomies here and do um, assessments on infants. So um, if a patient comes to see me, it's it's based on a referral from an IBCLC. Right. Um, but, you know, just establishing the importance of food introduction is really important. So we want to, you know, whether you're a baby-led weaning advocate or kind of a mix of purees and baby-led weaning, we know chewing <clears throat> and exposure to real whole foods is really, really important for jaw development. Mm -hmm. um, chewing is so hard, important. Hard foods, consistent. Hard foods, yep. Um, and we're seeing humans are changing. We're, we're growing differently. They say it's long face syndrome. Some say our faces are melting, which heart is very shape. dramatic. Yeah. Dramatic, yeah. Right. Adenoid faces. Mm -hmm. um, and we're really attributing it, looking back to 
diet and maybe too much processed food, mm -hmm. purees, things where we're not allowing our muscles and jaws to develop as they should be. So right. that's really important too in those first, that, in that first year. Right. Um, also, I just think exposure to different foods. I mean, obviously you need to work with your pediatrician, but that's when I tried to really expose my daughters to different seasonings and flavors and textures. And um, they're pretty great eaters now. And that's not always going to happen. But um, I just can't emphasize, you know, we all know food, let food be thy medicine. It's so, so important. And it can start so early. Right. How about uh, back to prenatal, uh, the B9 the vitamin B9, the, um, the folic acid, which is what's in most supplements, but really there are a lot of mothers that cannot convert it to folate because yeah. of the MTHFR gene. Um, yes. Yeah. Do you, do you counsel your patients on that at all? I don't. I don't. I mean, I certainly know about it. I'll speak to them about it. I know there's some concerns with midline defects, um, and so we talk a lot about that. I get right. I get a lot of questions about MTHFR. Right. Um, but I don't usually see parents at that point, but we'll we'll have conversations about it. I mean, there's right. still so much research happening in that realm. Yeah. Um because a lot of pediatricians it, just tell you to take a prenatal vitamin and that is the end of it. And yeah. really, I think people, I mean, moms should be tested for the the gene. I mean, it's quite absolutely. Prevalent. And it would make a big difference. And one of the biggest differences we see as dentists is that tongue tie. Yeah. Which yep. has big ramifications for the yeah. development of the child, how they sleep as an adult. Do you, um, do, you see, do you see children that come in where the parent says, oh, my child had a tongue tie, but it was taken care of at the hospital. But mm -hmm. you see it, you still see it because it's yeah, a all the time. tongue tie and they missed yeah. it. I mean, tell me about that. I find that fascinating because that happened to our granddaughter and mm -hmm. I, I see it more and more now. And so what, what needs to happen at the hospital where we're missing this? Post <sighs> tongue tie? Is That's it a, a hard one. Yeah. I mean, I'm at least happy they're talking about it now. Right. I mean, it, it, some hospitals, you can't even talk about tongue tie. You can, no. The nurses can't even say the words. <laughs> so literally yeah, I spoke to the nurses that say that. Yeah. yeah. So uh, they're like slipping notes to the moms um wow. so this is real yeah. um so i'm at least happy they're doing it and you know dealing with a brand new baby i kind of get it you're you're in and out you're just trying to help mm -hmm. initiate the feeding right i don't know if i have a quick answer for that because it's really hard to do unless you know maybe someone who's quite trained in it either an ent or a a dentist or whomever's on call and on rounds right. that has a lot of experience with it because yeah. it's you're fearful you don't want to go too deep right. you know so I kind of I do get it um I think the best thing to see to families is that the, the child may need a revision yes in the future um but the timing know. of that is so critical because those first three days if the baby doesn't latch on you know uh Mom's going to get frustrated with breastfeeding, may even get mastitis. I mean, these yeah. are all problems that I've seen. Um, my solution to this, and, and you, you basically said it already, you harped on that, is that um, at the birth, make sure you have someone that you know well that can identify a tongue tie, whether it's anterior or posterior. It could be your pediatric dentist, for example, and, yeah. and have a, um, like a spouse or a, your, your husband or a family member call them when the, the baby is out and about um, and bring them in and have them yeah. look at it and, yeah. Uh, yeah. and make that assessment quickly. I think that is yep. so important. Yep. Yeah. I mean, and a lot of the IBCLCs are pretty trained in it, but again, my understanding is in a hospital institutionalized setting, they can't say a lot. Yep. So sometimes you need to seek either a midwife or maybe you're working with a doula or right, right. you go see a private practice IBCLC yeah. um, that I'd, could help yeah. diagnose too. I'd rather have a, a surgeon there, someone that actually does tongue tie surgery. Yeah. So I'm off on that. That's, I mean, if you can afford it and if the hospital allows it, I think that for me right now is the solution. You're right. Doulas, yeah. uh, midwives, a lot of them are trained, but unless you've done tongue tie surgeries, you, you will miss 
uh, the really complicated posterior tongue ties. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's like anything. It takes practice. You know, it really does take practice to, it takes training and practice and thorough examination. And, and I do recommend working with an IBCLC because I am not a breastfeeding expert. So mm -hmm. we work very closely with the IBCLCs in our community. I'm even working on maybe having one come here. That's great during um, the procedure to, to be with the, the moms after. Right. Um, I think that would really complete the, the experience and, right. and help support the moms more too. Um, let's talk about, um, a, a lot of people ask about oil pulling for children. What do you think of that? Well, um, I'm not opposed to it if they, as long as they are older and can swish and swallow, uh, you know, swallow. If, they're, if they're yeah. able to swish and spit. Yeah. Um, I see no harm in it. I've even seen oil pulling a brand. I think it's called Mouth Monsters. Mm -hmm. they, yeah. They're little capsules right. for, for, for kids. Right. Um, so, you know, it's going to help them get in. It will help with their oral motor function. Right. You know, um, it can help lower bacterial count. It makes them more aware of oral hygiene and I, I wouldn't do it in a really young child though. I mean, you know, these are like seven, eight, nine year olds. Right. And I also don't know if I'd push it if it becomes a battle. We don't want right. to take steps backwards and make it a fight. Right. So exactly. if your child's interested in it, awesome. Right. You guys can do that as a family together. Right. But I mean kids love to spit, you know? Yeah. So <laughs> How about, uh, let's talk about breastfeeding and, and let's not get into the value and the nutritional value of breast milk. Let's talk about the dental part of it where just that, assuming there's no tongue tie, just the motion of the tongue, the muscular mm -hmm. action required to withdraw or extract uh, mom's uh, milk uh, from her nipple. I mean, why is that so important for, uh, you know, facial development and the health of the teeth? Yeah. So... It's, you know, babies have, the IBCLCs will say a pattern called suck, swallow, breathe. Mm -hmm. And what they're doing is they're starting, you know, the tongue is the most beautiful palatal expander mm -hmm. um, that you can imagine. Yep. Far be beyond any orthodontics or orthotropics. So ideally, we want our tongue up on, the, on our palate. And so every time a baby is, is suckling, that motion is happening and it's help it's helping to form the the jaws mm -hmm. and the musculature and you know the mandibular um, growth too so there's a lot of growth and development of the face that happens through breastfeeding and a lot of issues we see if children are maybe bottle fed mm -hmm. um, and again, sometimes you have to bottle feed your baby you know I breastfed as long as I could but then I had to go back to work. So we did this mix, um, but, and then there's beautiful appliances that you can do if you notice there is an asymmetry or any concerns with growth mm -hmm. when the child's a little bit older. Um, there's myofunctional appliances that they have now, like myo munchies and mm -hmm. things that can kind of get you back on track. Right. So, um, yeah, I mean, we're, we're definitely very pro breastfeeding here, but it's just not a reality for everyone. And so right. it's very difficult. But uh, the minute there's something wrong that where breastfeeding isn't going well, um, I think it's important to not lay blame, obviously. Uh, yeah. There's usually a good reason, functional reason of why it's not going well. It yeah. could be mouth breathing, it could be tongue tie, uh, it could be many things. Um, so it's important to to not feel bad. And I also think it's important not to give up too quickly and say, you know what, I just can't do this. There's yeah. got to be a reason yeah. why it doesn't work. And that's where a, a dentist needs to be consulted. I mean, there are some yeah. dental reasons for that. Um, when you see, uh, we can talk a little bit about this, but I want to talk more about it in our next session, but it's related to breastfeeding. How about a child that can't nose breathe? I mean, how difficult is it to <laughs> breastfeed? I mean, yeah. It's very difficult. I mean, impossible. Exactly. You know, they'll be choking and coughing and, um, right. they, you know, humans want to survive. So that's very threatening to the, we, we need oxygen. It's yeah. the most important nutrient. So if your child can't breathe through their nose, they're probably not going to be very interested in breastfeeding. Um, so again, at that point, either find talking to your IBCLC, 
going to a dentist that specialized in this or talking to an e your pediatrician and going to see an ENT to figure out why it can mean so right. many different reasons, you know, right. a retrognathic mandible, you know, tongue tie, lip tie, swallowing or neurological issues that are happening. So, um, a part of my job is I'm not the expert in everything, but I can help guide parents mm -hmm. to the right resource. So, right. right. Yeah. So what would you tell parents to look for at night? I mean, I, I ask them to, to watch their child sleeping. I, I ask them to go into the room. I mean, usually the kid goes to bed earlier than the parent does and mm -hmm. sneak in there, just kind of lean up against the back of the bed, you know, with your child behind you, listen. There's a lot of movement, a lot of turning, tossing and turning at the yeah. mouth is open, snoring, wheezing. Yeah. I mean, uh, yep. a lot of boogers coming out of the mouth. Um, yeah. I mean, what 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 do you tell your um, parents to look for uh, with with a mouth breathing kid? This is a hugely important question. Uh, it's it's a huge part of our exam and our questioning. So um, we we ask, you know, how does your child sleep? Do they wake up rested? Do they sleep all night? Um, have you noticed they're grinding? Have you noticed they're snoring? Do they breathe? Are they noisy breathers? Do they gasp? Do they breath hold? Do they toss and turn? Do they have a lot of nightmares or night terrors? Um, are they bed bedwetting? Yep. Are they bedwetting? Um, are there behavioral issues during the day? Have they been diagnosed with ADHD? I mean, the list goes on and on and on. It, do you, so I do recommend and I learned this um, at the Breathe Institute, you know, sleep studies are expensive, there's long wait lists, and there's a lot of false negatives. Right. Um, so what they recommend there is to encourage parents to go in and observe your child and video them yes. for a couple minutes, because you, you can gain so much information from that. And then you can share that video with your pediatrician, or your pediatric dentist, or your family dentist, or your ENT. Right. Um, so they, it's almost like you have proof. So um, if your child has their mouth open, back arch, you know, they're struggling to breathe. Again, humans want to live and survive. So we compensate our positions at night to open mm -hmm. our airways so we can get more oxygen. Right. Um, but that picture of the little cherub child with lips closed, right. sleeping peacefully, that is what should be happening right and, and i've learned this so, yeah i've learned this the hard way my daughter who will be seven next month you know you only know what you know when you know it and so um i look back at pictures of her mouth open mouth open mouth open and she has a posterior tongue tie that i never noted you mm -hmm. know um and we're working with myofunctional therapy and everything now but it's really important to figure out why your child's sleeping that way. Right. Um, is it as simple as allergies? You know, could an air filter and a humidifier and maybe some xylitol spray and mm -hmm. getting the cat out of the bedroom and right. getting the carpets out, could that help? Or is it food allergies? Usually it's gluten or dairy. Um, and this is where really you need to see an ENT to rule these things out. Is it tonsils and adenoids? Is it a deviated septum or something else developmental? Is it a tongue tie? You know, um, that can be part of the right. part of the diagnosis too. So um, it's and dentists, sometimes... dentists can see all this. I mean, they can see the tonsils. Yeah. Uh, they can see and and they can diagnose mouth breathing. Um, do you have an ENT that you refer to? A pediatric ENT? Uh, the Breathe Institute. Yeah, okay, exactly. <laughs> so the reason I asked you that, and I'm, I loved your response, they're really, every time you refer someone out to a, uh, someone like that, or even the um, primary care physician, uh, you, there's a lot of pushback. Like, there's no problem here. Yeah, there. I take that back. There is an amazing provider. I'm sure you've heard of him, Dr. Um, Gahiri. Yes. Here in Portland. He, but he he focuses a lot on phrenectomies. I know, right. you know, he will see children for other things, but he's on board. I mean, he's, he's way ahead of right. all of this. Yeah. But the point um, is, is that they're, they're not all on board. No, yes. no, they're not. Yeah. But you know, that's what I think places like the breathe Institute and the research that Dr. Gahari is doing is really trying to open the conversation and, and get the research out there because so, you know, many providers and, 
thank goodness, they want to see it in a journal. They want proof in the research mm -hmm. before they'll start discussing right. it. That, that um, takes 15, 17 years to get to us. Forever. Right? Yeah. 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 The other thing too, I just always like to mention this. So I was, I was literally taught in school that if a child's grinding to tell the parents to get earplugs, I was, that was, I was taught that. So, you know, obviously that's changing. We know grinding is, is common, but not normal. And so it's, you know, have, having to have a, a real um, conversation with parents that it could definitely be a sign of some upper airway resistance or something else happening. Um, right. Right. Yeah. Um, how, uh, when do you re usually refer to an orthodontist and do you have someone who, We'll take that referral at an early I age. Or oh, good. Tell us about that. Yeah. Well, she has become my best friend. So, uh, again, she was trained very traditionally and she's extremely research based, but she's very open minded and interested in taking more of a whole body craniosacral mm -hmm. um, approach to all of this and really looking at the airway she's using myofunctional therapy a lot too and that's it's dr jennifer crow um right up the street from me um but i refer so we we are in cahoots in the sense that we want to treat kids early now so yes. we're coming up with this plan so i'm mostly going to really try to work with the kids five and under Good. with either myo munchie or myo brace um you know, I'm not doing alpha appliances or anything in my office yet, but then around the age of five or when we think they're compliant, even as young as four, mm -hmm. I am sending them to her to either do an alpha or she's doing a lot with Invisalign right now too, which is really cool. Um, and, you know, maybe a little orthotropic. She's not quite as into the heavy orthotropics right now, right. but um yeah, it's 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 important to to make sure the earlier we intervene, Absolutely. the better. And yes. again, I was trained. Eh, we'll refer them when I mean it used to be when all their adult teeth were exactly, in. which then, is age 12, it, 13, right? I 12, mean, it's 13, ridiculous. and then it was whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay, we'll see them around seven or eight. Phase one, two, right? Yeah. Which is, I really think a lot behavior driven like the orthodontists i think just feel they aren't equipped to take care of these younger right. children you have to the appointment times have to be longer yes your team has to be okay seeing young children it's a very different right. appointment so maybe the pedi um, pediatric dentist should be the orthodontist and be, you know, <laughs> treating at age four and five i mean yeah i mean i plan eventually probably to start doing alf here right. It's just, you know, one thing at a time. That's an expansion <laughs> device, right? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, no. Um, I, I totally agree with you. Uh, I was uh, taught that as well, that you, know, you wait for the adult teeth to come in. But then what most people may not understand is that facial growth is done. It's finished. Some, most yeah. of it's done by age six. Yeah. And really, that's hard to undo. But even with Invisalign, which doesn't create a lot of force, you can do a lot in a child that's growing and developing. Yeah. Also myofunctional therapy, um, like yeah. needling and, and uh, let's talk a little bit about that. Do you have an in-house myofunctional therapist or uh, you've mm -hmm. been to the Breath Institute, you know Sarah Hornsby. Very well, I've taken her course almost twice because <laughs> I just couldn't keep up with it the first time. So she was kind enough to allow me into her second session. Right. Um, she's amazing by the way, yep. and as is the Breath Institute. Um, I do, not in-house yet, Again, we're working on a lot of these things right. um, together, but there is, um, it's, it's called Breathe, Breathe Works okay. and Corinne Jarvis, and she's trained and affiliated with the Breathe Institute and, you know, knows Sarah very well, and they're, they're awesome. So we, we're referring a lot of parents there. Sarah, Sarah has her people all over. She has her people, no doubt. Um, the problem, it's not a problem, but the challenge is a lot of people haven't heard of myofunctional therapy and so, um, you know, it's hard to explain why it's so important. It's just, you know, parents are overwhelmed enough as it is. So to add one more thing right. onto their plate, but, you know, we, we have lots of handouts and educational materials, and we really talk at great lengths about why that can be so beneficial to your child, both for function, you know, pre and post for nectomy, 
during pre post orthodontics, you know, I, my daughter's in my functional therapy right now. She, I'm going to do her release next month. Um, so I've seen tremendous benefits. She was right. again, a mouth breather and well, she actually wasn't a mouth breather. She nasal breathes, but her mouth open. She has that low tongue posture. Right. Um, and she's starting to grow her bottom yes. jaw starting to grow right. and she's and even that's wearing bad. her teeth down. And your mouth has to be closed. You can have both open, but that yep. doesn't work. You have to breathe your nose. Um, I mean, you, you bring up a great point. Um, that is that really, um, it, if your dentist isn't addressing and, and doesn't have access to a referral to malfunctional therapy, as you said earlier, the tongue creates the face and hence yeah. the patency of the airway and the ability to nose breathe. And so that's all so important. If you can't, if the tongue is tied and, and is tied for too long, and then even if the tie surgery is done later in life, even as late as six or seven, that tongue just doesn't know what to do. And that yeah. tongue, and the movement of the tongue and the position of the tongue at rest or during chewing and swallowing, even speaking, that has to be, that's not innate. That has to be learned in some cases. So yeah. uh, myofunctional therapists are key. I, I, I interviewed Sarah and I've known her for a while. She wrote a uh, appendix in my book on sleep. And I opened that interview with, you know, my first interview ever is of a myofunctional therapist. And that's how important I think yeah. myofunctional therapy is. Agreed. But unfortunately it's not, it doesn't, you know, most dentists don't really know about it or think that. So it's, it's. She's, uh, Sarah is changing that yes. day by day. I mean, she really, really is. Um, yeah, but you know, with my daughter, I mean, I, her lips are sealed now. I, I'll look over at her at a normal time when her mouth would be open and her lips right. are sealed just through myofunctional therapy. Right. Um, and it's real non-invasive. And basically the way I describe it to parents, if you know, if you're, especially if your child's tongue has been tied, think about after you break a bone, mm -hmm. you know, and it's in a cast, you haven't been moving it, you usually need some sort of physical therapy after to strengthen the muscles and get mobility and function back. Um, and it's kind of the same for the tongue. It's like physical therapy right. to work out all the muscles and the, the function that maybe right. has I mean, been. There are eight muscles. Being, eight muscles. It's yeah. not one muscle. There are eight muscles that have to work very, very proper. I mean, they, they have to work in unison. And the tongue motion is critical to, to live a good life. It really is important. Yeah. And you say this, I know, but I just think sleep is the... Yeah. You know, it's like sleep, oxygen, nutrition, right. you know, exercise and everything else. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. true. And it all starts in those first two or three years. And, and really as a dentist, uh, we're on the front line. We really are in the position of recognizing it sooner decades earlier in some cases than, than, uh, ENTs, uh, pediatric surgeons, uh, uh physicians, uh, MDs, primary care physicians, uh, it's, it's something that we really need to really be working more on. I mean, yeah, sure I agree. Dentists are trained that way properly. Yeah. And the thing is too, not to be intimidated. You don't need to have all the answers, right. but just recognizing it, planting the seeds, having the conversation, educating a bit, and then being able to send the parents to the correct resources. Right. That's really all that. That is a know. very good point, Stacey. Yeah. Uh, for all those dentists out there listening, it, it, it took me 10 years to get up to speed and each day I looked at it and read about it and took courses, I was overwhelmed and, and you're right. You don't have to have all the answers. All you need to know, and, and we already are trained to do that. We, we've, you know, we, facial development, that was, that was a, a unit in, in dental school, right? Um, occlusion, uh, even some anthropology, we got some of that in, at least in my dental education. We yeah. have knowledge, we just need to, apply it to what's now known about development and how crucial that is for young children developing into adults. So, yeah. Yeah. Yep. So we have a few more minutes left. Uh, we do have another hour coming up, so I don't feel bad. Don't have to say goodbye to you with a lot of unsaid <laughs> things. Uh, let's talk about one more thing. Um, uh, we, we talked about it a little bit earlier, but we've been talking about it more recently with tongue tie and so mouth breathing. How does mouth breathing as far as your concern, what you've seen as a clinician, how does it uh, contribute to the dental end of things, like dental disease? I'm talking about sure. gingivitis and decay. Yep. Uh, another great question. So mm. very commonly I'll have parents come in 
two children, you know, maybe similar diets, similar hygiene routines, or even, you know, child one has impeccable hygiene and diet, and child two has terrible hygiene and diet, and the child with the terrible hygiene and diet will have no cavities, right. and the one with the impeccable hygiene and diet is rampant, or just at least has some cavities. Right. And, and the so parent I, is wondering why. Or wondering it, may happen, why. it may happen within the same family. Yes. They both have the same habits, but one kid is, you're right, that is so um, well said. Right. Yeah, it happens all the time. Yes. And I, I, there was a point in my career, I was like, I don't know what to tell you. Right. But finally, you know, with all of this training and reading and everything, um, it, it was, I put the, connected the dots and it can be right. mouth breathing. Yeah. And, you know, when you breathe through your mouth, not only are you getting less oxygen, which is another topic about brain development and growth, but your mouth dries out. Mm -hmm. And so the protective qualities of your saliva are diminished. Correct. Um, and so your gums can get inflamed and it can look or mask itself as gingivitis, but mm -hmm. it's really from mouth breathing. Right. And you, you can get cavities because your saliva isn't there to protect your teeth. Right. Um, and the bacteria just love that environment. They right. just thrive. Yeah, it's it's so. a dysbiosis of the oral microbiome. If the pH of the gut microbiome dropped below 6.8 or lower, you'd have a dysbiosis in the gut as well. It's, it's that yeah. simple. Um, and you know, as you know, that gingivitis is so, uh, it, it has very uh, unique characteristics. It's uh, free margin bleeding or inflammation more on the front teeth, but less on the, on the posterior teeth. Yeah. It's usually on the upper anteriors, on the facial, and that's because that's where most of the air is coming in, but yeah. the back of the mouth doesn't dry out as much as the front of the mouth. So it's very, very visible to us. We know when a patient is mouth breathing, even as an adult. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. so that's, that's well said. Um, so uh, one last question. Um, so Certainly. kids, kids, uh, kid is mouth breathing. Um, at what point in time do you recommend mouth taping? And what do you think of mouth taping? <laughs> <laughs> I know. Um, full disclosure, my daughter mouth tapes okay. right now. Um, Seven? I, uh, she's six and a half. Okay. When we started, it was after we had started myofunctional therapy. You know, I, I think it really depends on the maturity and the uh, cognitive understanding of the child. Mm -hmm. Um. And I definitely would want parents to check with their ENT about yeah. this too yeah. and their pediatrician. Um, but I personally mouth tape every single night. I feel like a million bucks. Mm -hmm. If I don't do it, I notice it and I pay for it and I'm mad that I didn't put my tape on. So um, that's a hard question. I mean, I don't know, seven or eight. Right. You want to have a conversation with your child so, so they know it's not punishment. Mm -hmm. It's nothing that they're doing wrong. It's right. because we want to help you grow. You want to be the strongest kid you can be. You want the right. biggest, smartest brain. Right. Um, you know, your doctor your, says that we should do this too. And, and knowing that they, if they feel uncomfortable, they can take it off. I mean, you right. definitely don't want to put it on a child that can't right. freely remove it. Right. And there are tapes. Like, I use Somnifex. It just works well for me. It's pricey but I reuse it multiple times. Mm -hmm. It does have a little slit in it. Uh, yes. um, I know, Patrick, yeah, I really love it. Patrick mm -hmm. McEwen has myotape now, which is like a box around right. the mouth right. that can be a little bit better for kids too. So um, I, I don't know if I just go there and buy right. it and do it. I really right. think you should consult with other providers to, to make sure it's the right fit right. for your child. But you get a you, lot of pushback though, don't you, from the other you providers? Will. You will. I mean, for sure. I mean, yeah, but I, the research is out there and it's coming, you know, yeah. so even more. So again, I, I have a nasal breathing protocol handout that I give parents and it does talk about get a really nice air filter, make mm -hmm. sure the humidity is the proper level. So a humidifier, maybe pets out of the room, make sure you dust frequently, hypoallergenic bedding, get carpets out. Um, and then if that's not, or, and saline or xylitol rinsing, if that mm -hmm. doesn't help, maybe looking into gluten and dairy, right. you know, if, if still there's 
stuff happening, you know, then an ENT should be consulted. Right. I, I definitely say t lip tape is last, you yeah. know, unless the parent's super on board and right. there are some that are. Yeah. So uh, and it's important that the, the parents are mouth taping. If the child sees that they're the only one taping, yes. that's, that is punishment. It feels like that. So the parents have to be on board. You're right. Um, yeah. I've actually recommended it as, as young as three and yeah. those are in very extreme cases. And that's only if we can, if we think that it can actually open up the sinuses and you're right, you have to approach it from so many different ways, air filters, uh, carpets, gluten sensitivity, uh, animals, um, allergies, food allergies. Um, uh, I'd love to get your form and, and post it. If, if you have a URL to it, we'll put it in the show notes or. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's bar. I mean, it's kind of borrowed. It's actually Dr. Zaghi's information, right. but I, we, I, I don't want to sh share it without no, his it. permission, but. They'll, they'll just uh, have to call I, you and make an appointment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, it's basically what I just said. I mean, right. yeah, it's, yeah. it's. But it's it, so I important. I mean, how many times do you get that from your dentist? Well, hopefully a lot soon. Well, soon, <laughs> not often enough. So anyway, Stacey, it's so much fun talking with you. Uh, you Thank really you, Dr. You get the big picture. It's, I'm so glad you're on our functional provider list. And I'm so glad I don't have to say goodbye. Next time we're going to talk, because we're going to talk more, we're going to do another hour. And this is what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about fluoride. <laughs> yep, I know, I know. And okay. there's... There's going to be, we're going to have more news on that because there was a lawsuit against the EPA on that, which will we'll, uh, ended today. We're going to talk about sealants, stainless steel crowns. We get a lot of questions about that. Do you do stainless steel crowns? I used to. Um, no, no. I never not did. Not so much. I stopped I doing mean, it after dental school. Yeah, yeah. I, again, it's how I was trained, but we, I really do more fillings over pulps or right. we have zirconia crowns too, but we can get into that next okay. time. Okay, we'll talk yeah. about that. Uh, we're going to talk about fillings, which fillings are best, root canals, baby root canals, as they're called, palpotomies. Uh, we're going to talk more about anxiety with kids, um, um, especially anxiety as, as it relates to airway. A lot of the kids that mouth breathe are our toughest patients yeah. because, you know, we're putting water in the back of their throat. We're blocking their airway. Of course, they can't breathe. So what are they going to do? They're going to push us out of the way physically yeah. or physically. Um, and then also bruxism. I'd really like to get into bruxism and... Uh, and if we get any questions um, from viewers uh, in, from this episode, we will try and address all those. So uh, we'll try and plan it. next week or the week after, but it'll follow shortly after uh, this goes live. So again, thank you so much. Uh, it was so much fun. Thank you. If I was a kid, I'd be calling you right now. I, it, oh, you're I so, so much sweet. fun. And uh, my early dental experiences were not good. I can tell you exactly his name. I won't mention any names. I think <laughs> I can, I remember the office, the smell, um, you know, the chair, it was one of those big yeah. tongue chairs, you know, the old dent supply chairs and yep. it was so mean and nasty. The only good part was the, the, uh, toy drawer. He had the balsa wood, uh, rubber band air, drive air, uh, gliders. The airplanes. I and remember I those. I did everything I could just to get out of there with a glider in my hand, but it was a bad experience. And yeah. even to this day, I, I, I'm not nervous anymore, but but I'm just like, oh, you know, you, you, there's still that residue of that, uh, that in being imprinted upon of, of bad visits. So, so really to prevent that, uh, they need to see someone like you. They need to see someone who is just so excited. And I mean, you're a kid at heart. And I think that's why it's so important to. It's important. Yeah. I mean, it, this working with children is not for, for everyone, not for but everyone. I love it. I wouldn't, yeah. I probably wouldn't be a dentist if I couldn't work with kids. That's so. impressive. And a lot yeah. of dentists are the opposite. Most dentists, they call yeah. it community, they call it community, uh, you know, service, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, I just feel like, you know, I just feel like I'm making more of a, I feel like I'm making a difference. Oh, it's so huge. it's really important to me yeah. Yeah. to fill my cup. Yeah. It's not just, yeah. the difference is not just shiny teeth. It's everything. It's overall health yeah. and, and airway and, and good sleep and, and, and a good life. So again, thanks for yeah. what you do. And thank you. See you very soon again. Uh, we'll probably, okay. I don't know if we're going to post them together. People don't know about this until they see the first one. Maybe we'll, <laughs> we'll do it and then we'll post them both together. So again, thanks for your time and have a great day. Thanks Dr. Rahana. Bye Stacey. Be well. Bye.